Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise this morning. How many love that God comes through all the time? I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know the challenge that you're facing. Maybe you're here for the first time. Like we said, we're family. You know, that statement came now pretty close to 20 years ago. We were at our first service at the Rudy Hernandez Center. And I was doing welcome that day for the first time with a crowd of about 400 people or so. And I was looking at the crowd and I said, thanks for coming. Who's here for the first time? That was everybody. They're all, that's me. And when I looked at them that day, we're close to 20 years ago, the Lord said, this is your new family right here. And you got to take care of them. So that statement, when you come once, you're part of the family, the Holy Spirit gave me that at our first service. And we mean that. That means anything you go through, we go through it together. You lose a loved one, we go through it together. You get a bad report from the doctor, we go through that together, we fight together. You don't have a job, we help you get a J-O-B in G. We help each other out. Give Jesus a shout of praise. We're in a, we're in a good place. We're in a good place. For the ones, really quick, remain standing. We're going to pray. For the ones I haven't met, I'm Pastor Robert. My beautiful wife, Veronica, is here today with me. I love her. She's my road dog. I don't go nowhere without her. Um, I am Pastor Marco's younger brother. We launched out of the way. We launched another campus of the way in Arizona. People ask me, are you near Phoenix? No. Are you near Tucson? No. We're two hours away from the closest mall in Tucson. For some of you ladies, you wouldn't make it in Safford. Oh, I say guys rather. We're two hours away from any major city. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're right on the border of Arizona and New Mexico. 45 minutes east, you'll be in New Mexico, which we're going to start another campus in New Mexico. I believe it. So we, we just launched another way of outreach out there. We're so happy to be there. People are getting saved, full of the Holy Ghost. We're, we're, we're discipling people. We got a movie theater. We got a church. We just bought a bowling alley in Safford. Why? To have a place for the communion. So God's doing great stuff. You guys, would you bow your heads? Because we got to jump in this topic. I'm going to break a record today. Nine o'clock, I almost did it. I want to try again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover as best as I can, the whole book of Revelation in 42 minutes. The only person I've ever seen do that is John Hagee. He did it in 48 minutes. I'm going to try 42. I need a miracle today. Everyone bow their head and close their eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We love you. Touch every person here in this auditorium, those watching online. Those, are, those that are facing difficulty, touch them. Those who are facing a hard time, touch them. This is a place of hope. And as we study the end times, we try to unveil as best as we can what John's seen in that cave in the island of Patmos. We're going to do our best to describe it. Holy Spirit, from the front row to the back row, touch everyone. Those watching online, Holy Spirit power, go into your home, go into your workplace right now and touch you. Some of you guys right now, you're getting a miracle. You came in here with anxiety, depression, God's giving you joy. Some of you guys came in sick, I'll say it right now, you're going to get healed of cancer in Jesus' name. We serve the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Jesus heal, Jesus deliver, Jesus cause chains to continue to break off as we read the book of prophecy. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray for the Rock Church and Ecclesia. All these great churches. Bless them. Abundant living. Father, why do we pray for these churches? They're on the same team in the same battle. Saving souls and making disciples. Father, we bless our pastor, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five. You're going down. Come on. Let's jump in the book of Revelation. Turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1. As you're turning to that scripture, I want you to write a few things down. Why are we studying the end times? 
I know this series is the end times. I entitled it. A subtitle would be this. The end times unveiled. Someone say unveiled. So we're going to unveil the book of Revelation as best as we can in a new record of 43 minutes and 20 seconds. Why study the end time prophecies? Write this down. To build a greater sense of urgency to save souls. Time is running out. I just heard on the news last night, USC has canceled their graduations as of last night. They're having basically an internal civil war at the University of Southern California. All graduations are canceled at USC. With the Palestinian and the Israel confrontation, they stopped everything. The campus is closed as we speak. So anytime we're talking about the end times, Anytime we're doing ministry, it needs to be tied to souls. If it doesn't tie to souls, we're wasting time. Look at your neighbor and tell them, quit wasting time. Tell your neighbor, tell people about Jesus. Why do we study end time prophecies? To prepare our hearts for what's coming. It's to help build endurance. One of the assignments of the enemy is to keep us blind. We got people in the church, we got people in the world, they are spiritually blind and dead. They're blind, they don't know what's going on. So why do we study the end time prophecies? Greater urgency for souls to prepare us for what lies ahead because we got some crazy days that's ahead of us. Number three, to stay alert and be rapture ready. Pastor Marco talked about it a few minutes ago. I mean a few minutes, a few weeks ago on the rapture. Media team, I know we played this video back in the days. Media team, if you could get this video ready on the rapture. This is a a video where this guy is preaching in a church service because the rapture is gonna happen just like that. The Bible says you'll be working at Walmart. Doesn't say Walmart, but you'll be working along somebody. One will be taken. And the other one will be left. You'll be at Denny's. And you'll be eating at, well, they, don't, they don't got good steaks at Denny's. Dude. Let's go to Longhorse or Long, well, Texas Long, whatever that place is called. Yes, Outback. You're at Outback eating with some of your friends and family. So if, if some of your family is not saved, you'll be eating Outback steaks. And all of a sudden, you'll be gone. And your auntie will stay eating the steak, getting ready for the worst days of America and the world. Take a look at this rapture scene if it happened during the church service. Take a look at this really quick. This is how it's going to look like. Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... Jesus, help us. Cut it, media team. That's it. I'm scaring the whole crowd. better quit playing church. You better quit playing church. One foot in, one foot out. That stuff has to go. I would hate to be rolling up a joint when the rapture hits. I know Jesus. You don't know Jesus yet. I would hate to be committing adultery when the rapture hits. At the club, at the casino, wake up somebody, look at your neighbor, wake up, you better be rapture ready. Look at your neighbor, tell you better be rapture ready. This is no joke. Let's look at the book of Revelation. I got so many notes, I got 10 pages of notes. We should get out of here about 2.30. You guys okay to get out of here at 2.30? 
Yeah, I don't know. Now, we won't get out that late. We get about 145. Let's unpack Revelation. What does Revelation mean? Write this down. If you're not taking notes, take a bunch of pictures. When you're in a service like this, you got to become a very good note taker or a really good picture taker. If you don't write stuff down, you don't take pictures, you're going to be one of the blind ones in the end times. You're not going to know nothing about the end times unless you read it for yourself. So take pictures, write stuff down, become a great student in the house of God. What does revelation mean? It means unveiling. It means unveiling. Unveil, what does that mean? To remove the veil or covering from, to uncover, to unpackage, and to show what's been hidden. It's a supernatural disclosure. In these last days, there's going to be a greater revelation and insight than we've ever seen. For in the last days, all men will prophesy. We're going to see dreams and visions. How many want to see visions from Jesus? So unveiling is to unpackage. It's a disclosure of things that have been hidden. Now, who wrote the book of Revelation? We're just answering some questions. Getting to know the book of Revelation. Who wrote the book? His name is the Apostle John, one of Jesus' disciples. Who wrote the book of Revelation? John. All right, they're paying attention, Lord. I thank you, God. John wrote it. Where do we see that? Revelation chapter 1. How many old schoolers in the house? How many still have their Bibles in church? How many new schoolers? How many got the tablets out? I love you all too. You guys are good. Revelation 1 1. This proves that John is the writer of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1, 1 and 2. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ. I got to stop there. This revelation is from Jesus. If I could say this, be careful where you're getting your information from. Be careful what news you're watching. Be careful of what crazy knucklehead friends you're listening to in these last days. You need information from God. That's why you got to get in the DG. How many are in the DG up in this place? A DG, what is that? First timers, small home Bible studies. It's called discipleship group. Get into a small Bible study. Get a mentor. So this is a revelation of Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants, the events that are soon to take place. God showing John the events that is soon to take place. Some will say soon. He sent an angel to present a revelation to his servant John, verse 2, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now God has John at a secluded place. Where was John where he got this revelation? Can you imagine Get in this revelation from God. Where was John? Was he still in Jerusalem? Where was John when he got this beautiful and horrific revelation of the end times? He was at the island of Patmos. We see that in Revelations 1.9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering in God's kingdom. How many know that we're going to see some persecution in the last days here in America? Talk to other countries, they already experience persecution. They already experience martyrism. But it's coming to the U.S. The United States, wake up. It is coming here. I, John, your partner in suffering in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance which Jesus calls us, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus where was John? In the island of Patmos. He was in this island because he was exiled for preaching Jesus. We're coming in these last days that we're going to see persecution like we've never seen it before. But I love when the church is persecuted because the Holy Ghost comes out of our pores. Revival breaks out in the middle of persecution. Now, John was in the island of Patmos. 
That's not you today. You're not in a secluded island. But maybe you're going through a Patmos situation. Your marriage is struggling. That's your situation. You feel all alone. Bills are piling up. When I see the gas prices here again, I'm not used to it. I almost had a heart attack again. We, we were at 378 a couple months ago. We're at $4 now. We're at, we're at 37. I seen the gas price. I'm like, I love California. I can't wait to preach, but get me back to Arizona. It's the times we're living in right now. Maybe your patent situation is an addiction. And you're bound. I got good news. In these Patmos situations, get ready for God to show up. Get ready for God to show off. Get ready for God to set you free. How many freedom in this building? Give Jesus a shout of praise. But right before John was ex, wait a minute, show the cave. As best as they know, now this is Greece, as best as they know of records, as best as they can, this is where John was at. He was in a cave all by himself, and an angel shows up and gives him a revelation. The Orthodox Church now has made an amazing church there. They worship God on this place, but this is the cave where John gets these revelations. Now, when you read the book of Revelations, it's very, very interesting how the book of Revelation starts off. It doesn't start off right away after the rapture. Look where the book of Revelation starts off. Go to Revelations chapter, go to Revelations chapter 2. And let me explain this for a moment. Right before John gets the revelation of what's going to take place after the rapture, he deals with the church first. Churchgoers, you've been here for a while. Judgment starts in the house of God first. It starts here with you and I. So before John gets this beautiful and horrific revelation of the, the, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, the thousand-year millennium, before he gets all this revelation, God says, let me show you the current churches. There's current churches, John, that are struggling. They've lost their faith. They've lost their first love. And just like that church then was having their challenges, of losing their passion for God, God is reminding us today, don't become one of these churches. Don't become these churches who lose their passion for God, who, lo who loses their love for people. Don't be one of these churches in the last days. Let me go through the seven churches that God shows John of that time and the current condition of the church now. The first church, the church of Ephesus, we see this in Revelations 2, 4, and 5. This is Jesus speaking to John, but I have this complaint against you, church of Ephesus. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen away. Turn back to me. Do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. So before John gets this revelation after the rapture, he tells him, John, let me show you the current church. And now we fast forward to 2024. Let me show you where some of the churches are at. These are churches who have lost their passion. They've lost their love for God. They become selfish they become not, not, not obeying God's word. They rather please themselves and please God. But I'm thankful here at the Way Road Outreach and churches around the world, we're not going to be the church of Ephesus. We're going to be church on fire for God. Don't lose your first love. Get out to adopt the block. Go find somebody who's hurting. People tell me all the time, I, I don't feel God. I, get to adopt the block. I make it a point now in Arizona because we haven't started our prison ministry yet. Where my prison ministry at? We're getting ready to start prison ministry in Arizona. I make it a point 
to find out who's in jail, because our town is small. And I make it a point now, I try to go once a month to go visit people in jail. Someone's daughter, someone's son, someone's uncle, someone's, I visited the other day, a grandpa one time. Visiting people, why? To keep my love for the people. To put my, to put some of their shoes on and feel what they're feeling at times. So the first complaint, church of Ephesus, the second church. Now this is a good church. The church of Smyrna. Someone say Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, 8. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. I'm a, I know about your suffering. Go down, to verse, go down to verse 10. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you in prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful to me, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Out of the seven churches, this is the only one that's remaining faithful. The church of Smyrna. Again, these are current, current churches that were in the area now of Turkey. But this is the condition that God is showing us of the modern church today. Church of Pergamum, Revelations 2. They had a tolerance for Baalism. That means following the customs of this world, idolatry, immorality. The church of Thyatira, Revelations 2.18. Tolerance of a Jezebel spirit. Tolerance of perversion, immorality. We have churches and groups that have Jezebel, that have, that have a control. And these are churches that are operating. And Jesus is waiting. Why hasn't the rapture happened? The rapture hasn't happened because he's waiting for those last few to get saved. He's waiting for those last groups to get right. So you got the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira, the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, and the church of Laod uh, Laodicea. This is a lukewarm church, spiritually poor, spiritually blind, and naked. These are the conditions. But we're here to, to clarify right now, not in my house. My house will serve the Lord. My house will be on fire for God. My children will serve God. We will continue building churches around the world. Give Jesus a shout of praise. We will be the church of Smyrna in these last days. So now. He shows John the condition of the churches. Now he goes in on what's going to take place after the rapture. Again, when's the rapture going to happen? Any second, any time. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Jesus will come just like that video. Now, what does John see after the rapture? Number one, write this down. Right after the rapture of the church, God allows John to see the rise of the Antichrist. Which opens up the seven-year tribulation. It's part of the tribulation, the seven seals. Where do we see the Antichrist on the scene for the first time? Revelations chapter 6, 1 and 2. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come! I looked up and saw a white horse. That is not Jesus. Pastor Joe did that this last week. This is not Jesus. We see the second coming of Jesus later in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation 6, this is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the, four, four, the first horse that we see is the Antichrist. This is not Jesus. The horse was there. Its rider carried a bow. And a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. We see the Antichrist for the first time. Someone told me months back, Pastor, is the Antichrist alive? No one knows. Now, if the rapture happened in the next 12 minutes, which I hope it doesn't because we've got to get people saved still. 
If the rapture happened today, then yes, the Antichrist is alive. Why? Because after the rapture, he begins to rise up. Everybody begins to notice the Antichrist, a man that's very distinguished, a man that we've never seen other than Jesus. Very wise. Who is the Antichrist? Where is he coming from? Who is he? Let's answer these questions. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist will be Lucifer in the flesh. So Jesus was God in the flesh. The Antichrist will be Lucifer in the flesh. Pastor proved that. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come. Until there's a great fall in the way first, which we're, we're seeing a great fall away of church goers right now. And the man of sin is revealed. Here goes, underline it. The son of perdition. That's Lucifer. The son, that's the Antichrist. He's the son of Lucifer. Who is, who is the Antichrist? He's Lucifer in the flesh. Full of Lucifer. Full of his demeanor, full of hatred, full of anger. He will be Lucifer in the flesh. The Antichrist is mentioned over a hundred times in the Bible, not just once or twice. How many know when God repeats himself, we better listen? So over a hundred times, the Antichrist is revealed. He's called the little horn in Daniel 7. He's called the king of fierce countenance, the prince who is to come, the one who makes desolate. The king who shall do his own will, that's Lucifer. The man of sin, the son of perdition, there it goes, the lawless one, the antichrist, and the beast. Anytime you see the word beast in the book of Revelation, he's talking about the antichrist. Who's he talking about? When you see the word dragon in Revelation, that's Lucifer. Someone will say Lucifer. So when you're reading the book of Revelation, when you see beast, beast, he's talking about the antichrist. Now, where is the Antichrist going to be born? Daniel 9.26 gives us a little snippet of what heritage he's going to come from. Daniel 9.26. We're answering our question now. Where is the Antichrist going to be born? At this period of 434 years, the anointed one, Jesus, will be killed. His kingdom still unrealized. And a king, here's the Antichrist. And a king will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. Well, we know from history that both Jerusalem and the Jewish temple were destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Therefore, according to the book of Daniel, the Antichrist will be of somewhat of the Roman heritage. So get this out of your head when you see an American in the United States. Oh, I wonder if he's that. No! He's coming out of Rome, out of the Roman heritage. So when you see people, is that Antichrist? Now, if you see somebody from Rome, <laughs> he could be alive. Some of you guys are like, oh, my gosh, I'm not traveling to Europe anytime soon. You might... You might butt into the Antichrist. We laugh, but man, it's real. What will the Antichrist establish after the rapture? Write this down. Take pictures. What's he going to establish? And I'm here to say right now, this is, some of this stuff is already happening. What's the first thing? What's one of the major things he's going to do? The Antichrist will set up a peace treaty with Israel, which is really going to be this. The start of the seven-year great tribulation. Because there's different levels, which I'll explain in a second. There's different levels of the tribulation. So the Antichrist is going to sign a peace treaty. Daniel 9.27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of time set of seven. But after the halfway mark, three and a half years, he'll put an end to the sacrifice and offerings. He's going to bring peace to the Middle East. He's going to be the only man that's going to accomplish peace in the Middle East. He will sign a peace treaty with Israel and all the other nations. But 
He'll break it at the three and a half year mark. Because I know Satan is a liar. He'll give you all the nice stuff. I hate watching these beer commercials. I hate them. You know why I hate them? They show all the girls in bikinis and they're on the boats, guys with six packs. You don't get a six pack drinking beer. You get a 12 pack like this. They show all, all the partying. It's so fun. They're showing them gamble and all the pretty girls. Yeah, right. You know where drinking will take you? It'll take you through a rough marriage. It'll make you do things you never want to do. I know what addiction does. We've all seen addictions in our families. So he'll pretend to be good. Peace in the Middle East. Everybody signed this contract. Everybody. That's why we see this war with Iran and Israel and Hamas. Why? Because it's war. So when the Antichrist comes up, he says, hey, you guys, we need to stop. How about we all just sign a peace treaty so everybody can be on the same page and he's going to break it. The Antichrist will do this, Revelation 13. Seven and eight, the Antichrist will set up a one world government, which that could happen any second, even now. Revelation 13 7, the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, because he'll be empowered by Lucifer. And he was given authority to rule, there it goes, he'll be given the power to rule. Over every tribe, every government, every country, he will set up a one world government. Next thing he'll do, the Antichrist, he'll set up the mark of the beast, which is 666. Pastor, is that really in the Bible? Sure is. Turn your Bibles and your tablets, Revelation 13, 16 through 18. So he's setting up a peace treaty, setting up the one world government. Now he's trying to control the world's economy, set up this one world currency. Revelation 13, 16 through 18, he required everyone, small and great, rich and poor. It doesn't matter how much money you got, tribulation, how poor, you're going to have to get this mark if you want to stay alive. Let me say this, I didn't say this last service because it's impossible to cover everything. Whoever gets the mark of the beast... It's over. It's done. You can't repent anymore. Once somebody gets the mark of the beast after the rapture, during a tribulation, it's over. That person now is damned to go to hell. There's no repentance any longer. So if anybody does stay, don't get the mark. Which I believe nobody's going to stay in this room. We're going to get saved. It's up to you. Verse 17, no one could buy or sell. They can't do anything without the mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Verse 18, wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve this great meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. He will create everybody to get this mark of the beast. It could be a number. It could be a QR code. It could be a chip. Now, remember, when you read the book of Revelation, there is some medical, there's, there's some metaphors there. Because re remember, John got this thousands of years back. And he's trying to paint a picture for us, for us to see. He's trying his best to present what he saw, what Jesus showed him. But make it clear, everybody will get the mark of the beast. You won't buy. If you're pregnant, you can't, you can't have your baby at the hospital unless you have the mark of the beast. There is no more Stater Brothers or Bashes where we live unless you get the mark. Now, Pastor, what if one of you come against the Antichrist? Write this down. The Antichrist, he will behead everyone who doesn't worship him. Well, I don't want to get the mark where he's going to kill you then and he become a martyr. In the years of the tribulation. That's found in Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw the thrones and the people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus. He'll behead everyone. The Antichrist is going to deceive people. He's going to do everything he can to be like Jesus. He will even get a fatal wound, the Bible says, in the head. But he's not really going to die because only Jesus rose from the dead. But he's going to try to imitate him. He's going to get a severe uh, a blow to the head, which, which a lot of scars, he's going to get shot in the head. 
And he's going to act like, here I am again. I rose from the dead. Why? To gain power. Pastor, where's that at? Revelation 13, 3. I saw that one of the heads of the beast, there it goes, Antichrist, seemed wounded beyond recovery. He's going to get so wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world will marvel at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. So now John sees the rise of the Antichrist. Next, he sees the seven-year tribulation. Write this down. We'll take a picture. Three levels of the tribulation. Seal judgments. Those will be the first ones that's going to come after the rapture. Seal judgments. And with these judgments, they get worse, they get worse, and they get worse. So the first set of judgments is seal judgments. The second level will be the trumpet judgments. The last judgments will be the bowl judgments. Seal judgments, trumpet, and bowl. I like what Pastor Joe said on Wednesday. He said, we're not going to study too much about the tribulation because we're not going to be there. And Pastor Joe is 100% right. I don't know about you, but I'm, got, I'm up in the rapture. I'm not going to have to go through this stuff, but you're going to have to get right with Jesus. But we need to talk about it so we know. We need to talk about it so you can explain to your friends and to your family. So now John sees the seven-year tribulation. Let me give you a few of them because there's way too many. Revelation 6, 7, and 8. Here's one of the horrific things that people are going to have to withstand in the tribulation. And before I read these, people are going to try to kill themselves, the Bible says. In the book of Revelation, they're going to try to kill themselves and God won't let them. They're going to get guns. They're going to get drugs. They're going to get whatever. They're going to try to kill themselves. But God says, no, you're not going out like that. Because part of the tribulation is love. Pastor, how is this love? He's giving people another chance to get saved. If God wasn't a God of love... It just be a rapture and we're all gone. And all the people just get thrown into the lake of fire. But God says, I'm going to give them another chance. I'm going to rapture my church. My church will be gone. But now I'm going to give people time. It is a judgment. God is judging the sins of man. But in this judgment, in this severity, we're going to start reading just a few minutes. He still has love wrapped around it. Give your life to me. Don't you see how bad it's getting? Give your life to me. Look at Revelation 6, 7, and 8. Here's one of the horrific things. When the Lamb broke up the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being saying, come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Again, this is a four horse of the apocalypse. You got the white horse. You got the green horse. Its rider was named Death. His companion was the grave. These two were given authority. Look at this. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth. To kill with the sword, which is murder, which is war. To kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. Right now there's 8.1 billion people right now roughly on planet earth as best as we could count. 8.1 billion. To paint a picture for you in the tribulation in a day's time or a week's time, as you study it more, it's really like a day. In one day. Two billion people, 25 million, are going to die in one day. Famine, sickness, and wild animals. Can you show some pictures of wild animals? Wild animals, yeah. In the tribulation, the animals become wild. I don't know about you, I hate snakes. Anybody hate snakes? And God took me to Arizona with all the diamondbacks. God has a sense of humor. He takes me to the diamondback capital of the U.S. Snakes everywhere. We got scorpions in our beds we find, all kinds of. There's bugs I've never seen in Arizona. It's just, they're scary. This is the tribulation. One of the things, the animals will turn wild. 
Those pit bulls in San Bernardino. <laughs> those chihuahuas. <laughs> Some of you got chihuahuas. They're, they'll bite off your ankle. <laughs> Animals become wild. So people are going to be taken off to the mountains, it says the Bible, trying to kill themselves not to go through this. Let me give you another one. Revelations 9. I got so many. Let me see. Yeah, let me give you Revelations 9. Look at this one. Revelations 9, 1. Yeah, I'll try to read. Let's go down. Yeah, I got to read all of it. Can you guys handle a couple more minutes? Can you guys handle it? Let me give you another. Look at this one. Revelations 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet. Sealed judgments. Now I'm reading one of the trumpet judgments. After the trumpet, you still got bowl. But it's getting worse and worse and worse. Read it for yourself. Read the book of Revelation. Now we've entered some of the trumpet judgments. The fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the earth and sky. Just meteorites, asteroids just hitting the earth. He was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. This is in hell. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace. And the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Look what came out of this pit. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth. And they were given power to sting like scorpions. Verse 4. They were told not to harm any of the grass, the plantation. Forget about that. They were told not to harm the grass, the plants, the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion, like Safford, Arizona, or worse. In those days, people will seek death. Here you go. They're going to try to commit suicide, but God ain't going to let them. Verse 6, in those days people will seek death, but they can't find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Look at verse 7. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. You talk about a serious locust. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like wings, roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions. And for five months they had the power to torment people. Get up. I tried. Google doesn't have pictures for this. John didn't either. He's just trying to ride at the angels, pouring this thing in this cave. And, he's, and we're trying to get a little picture of how these locusts will look. Where are they coming from? The bottomless pit. There's a pit somewhere in hell that these things are being locked up. God has Bill Weiss if he's seen one of these in hell. <laughs> they're being locked up. And they'll be released for some of the time during the tribulation just to torment people, not kill them. How many have ever been bit by a scorpion? Two people. I've never been bit, but I guarantee you a scorpion didn't look like that. That's what's going to take place as the tribulation goes. And Matthew 24, 21 says this. This will be the worst time of suffering since the beginning of the world. And nothing this terrible will ever happen again. John sees the condition of the church. John sees the rise of the Antichrist. John sees now the seven-year tribulation. Why the tribulation period? You can write this down and take a picture. To bring time to an end. It's got to bring time to an end when it's all done. It's helping bring in time to the end. Why a tribulation period? To shake man from his false sense of security. We have felt that in America the last few years. Takes man from their false sense of security. Well, I'm going to, I got money and I can do this not during the tribulation period. Well, I'll get away with this and I'll get away with that. Not in the tribulation period. It's going to knock man down to his or her knees. Or 
submit to the Antichrist and go to hell with him. Why a tribulation period? Yeah, to give people, I said it earlier, to give people one last chance to choose Christ or to choose Satan. One last chance, choose Christ or choose Satan. So John has given us three prophetic, major, major prophetic things that's going to happen. Let me give you the last five just to write them down. God releases the current condition of the church. God unveils the rise of the Antichrist. God unveils the seven-year tribulation. God unveils, Pastor Joe touched on this very briefly, and we don't have time to go through the battle of Armageddon today, the battle of Armageddon. That's when Satan... With all the countries, with all those who hate God, will try to fight God. Yeah, right. You can't fight God. And I love what Pastor Joe said. We'll be coming down with him. I can't wait. We're going to be in our white robes and we're coming down to planet Earth. And Satan, they're, they're, they're so stupid in all these countries. They're, they're going to be like this with a gun. <laughs> You're trying to fight God. They're going to be with guns and tanks. You talk about morons, stupid morons. <laughs> really? Fighting God naturally is supernatural God. And the Bible says that Joe, his sword will come out and just wipe. There's not even a war. It's not even a, they call it the battle because people are just gathering. It's not a battle. It's annihilation by Christ. Our Savior, our Lord. But I like what Joe said. Maybe he'll let us down just kick the devil one time. I'd love to put a whooping on him just one time. How many love to put a whooping on Satan? This is how you put a whooping on Satan. Serve Jesus. Be sold out for God. Become a disciple. Lead discipleship groups. That's how you whoop Satan. Save souls and make disciples. Glory be to God. Next one, second coming of Jesus. He mentioned that. Thousand year millennium. Thousand years. We're going to live with Jesus on the earth. That's found in Revelation 20. God shows John the great white throne judgment. And that's not for us. That's for the unbelievers. The great white throne judgment, that's for unbelievers. People during the tribulation period. People in hell. They'll go through this judgment and now finally be cast in the lake of fire. And the last one, the new Jerusalem, which is basically heaven. John sees all this. Well, pastor, what happens to the devil? I love it. Revelations 20.10. He's finally going to get his butt whooped right here. Forever and ever. Revelations 20.10. And the devil who had deceived them was hurled in the lake of fire. And burning brimstone sulfur, where the beast, Antichrist also, and the false prophet, all his demons also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Satan is defeated forever and ever. And we're in heaven forever. Walking on streets of gold forever and ever. No more pain, no more suffering for us forever and ever no more cancer forever and ever no one passing away forever and ever worshiping jesus forever and ever in the new jerusalem in heaven give jesus a shout of praise the book of revelation in 43 minutes and 28 seconds we're gonna cover everything Let's stand up, you guys. Put up the timeline. Take a picture of this. Take a picture of the timeline. No one leaving at this time. Give us a couple more minutes to pray. Please don't leave. You cause a lot of distraction when you leave. Unless you're a doctor, you got to get the surgery to go do your surgery. Right? Yeah, when people leave, it causes a lot of distraction. Souls are about to get saved. Take a picture of this timeline. I didn't have time. I did have time, but I'm not a computer guy, so I couldn't do this. I was trying. I just couldn't do it. This current church age, the next graph that, I'll co the next graph that I have when I do it over 
is the church repenting here too. Because that's where we're at. He's waiting for people to get right. That's the only reason why he hasn't come. He's waiting for the people, the current church, churchgoers, quit playing church, quit being lukewarm. He's trying to get them saved. So I'll add that in the next one. Eternity, the verbiage you're going to see in the Bible is the new Jerusalem, but that's eternity. It represents hell, heaven. Let's just see, I just put eternity to make it easier to follow. Here it goes. We're going to give a time of prayer for you to get saved. With a crowd this size, there might be 100 people who need to get saved. I don't even know. You're not saved. You're not right with God. If the rapture happened right now, you're going to get left behind. You're not saved. How do you know if I'm saved, Pastor? You've received Jesus. And all your friends can see a little bit of fruit. If you're still partying every day and want to get drunk every weekend, you're not saved yet. They said, well, I don't know. No, we don't do that. Saved people don't go to the clubs anymore. We don't do that. It's just not, that's not what we do. Now, you might do it for a little bit when you first come to church. You go to church, you're still struggling with the club. I get that. I understand that. I understand the struggle. But eventually it has to stop. If you're a Christian and you've been saved for 10 years and you're still cussing, after 10 years, there's something wrong. The abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Christians don't cuss after a while. They don't do that. part of it. I haven't cussed in over 20, how many years have I been saved now? I've been married 20 years. I haven't cussed in like 35 years. Not because Robert is all that. I ain't nothing. I'm saved. I, I choose my words a little better. Jesus, the Holy Ghost, controls my tongue now. I haven't flipped anybody off in 35 years. <laughs> That's not what Christians do. Someone cuts you off in a freeway, just... You might follow them for a little bit, but they need nothing. <laughs> Can't do it in Arizona. Arizona, I don't know if you guys know, you could carry in Arizona. Everybody has guns. My first service there, 20 guys walked in with a pistol here. My first service there. I'm like, I, didn't, I forgot that you could carry in Arizona. So the pastor that was there that handed over the church to us, Pastor John, beautiful guy, Pastor Fran, I love them so much. I said, John, there's like 20 guys in the meeting. <laughs> He's warning Pastor Rob, you're in the safest place in America. I said, well, I don't feel like it. <laughs> you got a gun in California, that ain't no good. He goes, no, I'm packing too, Pastor. <laughs> and the pastor who was trading me had this big, I don't know what it is, because I don't know guns. I own three of them now. <laughs> we go shooting all the time, not all the time. I've been shooting a couple times. I, I still get scared. <laughs> Are you saved? Here it goes. We're doing an altar call. Two things. If you just need prayer, we want to pray with you. You're going through a hard time. Just give us a couple minutes to pray with you. I don't know what you're going through. God does. But why don't you pray with something? The Bible says when two or three, when they agree on something, it's done. I'm not saying you can't pray on your own and get miracles, but there are some you need to come in agreement with. There's something when you agree, boom, because that's scripture. So if you just need prayer, I'm going to count to three, you're going to raise your hand. Here's the second thing, you're not saved. You're not born again. You haven't given your life to Jesus yet. If the rapture happened right now, you'll be left behind. You're scared. You watch that video, you're like, I need to get saved right now. You know you're not right with God. You're like the church of Laodicea. You're lukewarm. One foot in the church, the things of God, one foot out at the club. 
The Bible says if you're lukewarm like this, he'll spit you, he'll vomit you. It makes God sick to his stomach, the lukewarm church, because they're trying to play God. They're trying to cheat on God. He can't cheat on God. Those that try to cheat on God, it makes them sick. He'll vomit. They're like, oh, it's gross to him. So get right with him. So here it goes. You want Jesus. And like Gavin said, and times is coming, but let's fast forward. You could die tomorrow. You could die in 20 minutes. So pastor, now you really scare me. That's just life. Heart attacks, cancer, car act. It just happens. Here it goes. You want Jesus, you want to get saved, you want God, or you just say, man, Pastor, I'm going through a lot. I need prayer. Raise your hands on the count of three. One, two, three. Right now, raise your hands. Raise them. I need Jesus. I want to be saved. I need prayer. I need God. I want Jesus. I want him to forgive me of my sins. All those who raised your hands, come to the front. Even if you didn't raise your hand, come to the front. If you need prayer, you need a miracle. Come to the front. You need family prayer. Come. Your kids need prayer. Come, come, come. Come. You need Jesus. Come. You need a miracle. Come. Cancer could dry up. I've seen it. I've seen people healed of cancer just by walking up to the front. Boom. Cancer leaves their body because Jesus heals. Save.com. We're going to help you. There it goes. I got saved. We'll help you. This is not the end. This is the beginning of your walk with Christ. Baptism, your next step. Holy Warriors, join the DG. Get ready. Head by every eyes closed. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I ask forgiveness of all my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. Become my Lord and Savior. Set me free. Holy Spirit, fill me. Break off all my bad habits. Jesus, I surrender. I become a disciple of Jesus, and I will make disciples. Today I'm saved. Today I'm born again. Heal me. Deliver me. Set me free. Thank you, Jesus. I'm born again on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name. 